Welcome to What's Your Next Move, Aging on Your Own Terms. I'm Lisa Sini. And I'm Addie Sini, her daughter. And last week, my grandpa almost died. Yeah. And we're going to talk about it. So we're going to tell you about patient advocacy, how to communicate with medical professionals, and also how to navigate your family in these life-threatening situations. That's a lot. So let's start unpacking. Okay, so it was a big week. It was a long week and I am exhausted. We're emotionally, physically, mentally, all of all of it just exhausted. And I'm sure there's a lot, a lot of people out there that are emotionally, physically exhausted from dealing with loved ones being sick. And it's Mm -hmm. just really hard. Um, But just to kind of start at the beginning, Mm -hmm. um, I get a call. And my gramps is in the ER and it's severe. And when you get that call, you freak out a little bit. And fortunately, we had a hospital right down the road. And um, so I was with there within five minutes. And um, my mom can tell you a little bit of the of the backstory of kind of how we got into this position. So, yeah. So um, my dad had had kind of a stomach diverticulitis incident and then had a reoccurring infection, had to take him to the ER. Um, I feel like in the last three months, we're frequent flyers at the ER. Uh, And when they did a scan, they found a bunch of tumors on his kidneys. And then when we met then with the doctors, they said, um, look, this looks like cancer. And one of the best things that we can do is do an ablation, or we could watch it, or we can do some other things. But ablation basically freezes it. Um, with very low risk. So uh, he agreed to do that and had the procedure done and then was doing well and then started to get a little cuckoo. And my mom uh, worries a lot. And so she'd say, he's talking out of his head. I go up to their place and he'd be perfectly fine. And, you know, sometimes parents or grandparents can put on a show and make it seem like they're a lot better than they are. Little did we know he wasn't really drinking water. He wasn't really peeing. And it turned into where he couldn't really breathe. And my son went up to check on him because my mom had called and immediately called the doctors and they said, get him to the ER. I was then contacted and I went there. And it wasn't like our normal ER visit. It was... They got the numbers back and he was in complete renal kidney failure. So I uh, immediately had to go up to the ICU and then try and get them his numbers down for potassium. Yeah. And so- it was very, very, very scary because at any second, you know, you're kind of getting these hints from the doctors and nurses. Like if you would have brought him in a day later, he would have been gone. So called all the brothers and sisters in. There's five of us and then all the grandkids. And started to maneuver through this process of his kidneys being shut down and it seemed like he was bleeding someplace. Yeah. So um, from my perspective, my grandma had said that Gramps wasn't feeling very good for the last week. He had this procedure. He had an ablation and a biopsy done. Um, I was convinced that he was just old and <laughs> that he w- he had gone well, under anesthesia. Well, that's a true story. Well, I mean, he is old. That's a true I'm story. Not really, that's not something to be convinced <laughs> no. of. He's, he's 85 years old, so... Um, but I, you know, he had, he went under anesthesia. So anesthesia can take up to sometimes like two months, Mm -hmm. um, for you to be cognitively clear afterwards. And so when I went and spoke to them, he's also really not good at articulating what is wrong with him, um, or what's not feeling well. He's a little bit like a dog or a cat. He's like a dog. I was just, yeah, yeah. He's a little bit like a dog. Yeah. And he's like, ow, that hurts. And you're like, why? And he's like, can't tell you. Where (laughs) does it hurt? Where? I don't know. I don't know. I just feel like crap. <laughs> yeah. And um and Mama was worried and and she oftentimes uh responds and reacts kind of the same no matter the scale of what's going on. That's so that's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's a great way to put yeah, it. So, so you don't know how to read it yeah. um, because she's uh, she's not chicken little. Um, but, but the sky is falling a lot. Yeah, she and gets also, very upset because she loves him very much. Yes. She loves us very much. Yeah. And also for me, my parents or my grandparents have been 
dying for forever. I mean, they've almost, yeah. you know, every everybody's always convinced that they're, you know, sick or that there's something going on. And so I'm very used to kind of just absorbing that and saying, okay, mm-hmm. well, are there things we can do? And let's talk about it and have you called the doctor. And so I went and saw him on that Friday and it was already 7 p.m. at this time. So it's not like mm-hmm. we could have called the doctor really. And they weren't in the office anymore. And uh, I just said, you know, he's not feeling well, but I I got him to stand up. I got him to walk around. I said, we can put, you know, you, if you hold on to his walker like this, we can do that. Um, but then on Monday, it just kind of all shifted. And yeah, and so I walk into, we've got way too many people in the emergency room. So um, we're an Italian family. So um you know, we don't have a lot of boundaries would be the best way <laughs> yes. I could yeah. say it. And, um, you know, we've got several people that have worked in hospitals for a long time. And then I was an interior designer in a hospital. And so I don't have a boundary. Um, my one sister doesn't have a boundary and then everybody else loves everybody. So we're just kind of like, you know, they say like one person back. We had like eight. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Which you don't really recommend as well because no. <laughs> you can't fit the actual team in there that needs to be in there. But eventually it just kind of escalates and he's in the ICU and that's a very scary place to be. Um, but that's where we initiated kind of conversation with the doctors. Mm-hmm. Um, and we did a lot through a bunch of different formats. And I feel like that was the key to communicating with these medical professionals is that you not only do things verbally, you do them in person, mm-hmm. you do them, you know, um, chatting, you know, on their through every medical system. Uh, our thing is called Mar- my chart for my yep. grandparents. Um, and there's a variety of different kind of approaches that we took. But do you want to talk about why that was kind of important? Yeah. So I think first you have to recognize is that most medical professionals um, are they're they've they went through a pandemic and they're tired and then we're very understaffed. There Super. is not a lot of nurses. There's a huge nursing shortage out there. Um, it was Labor Day weekend. Yeah. Uh, well, th- not at yeah, the beginning. Grace, poor timing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> not at the beginning, but when it started getting critical, it was Labor Day weekend. Um, and, you know, the other thing is you are or your loved one is the patient advocate, the advocate, like no one cares more than you guys do. And no one knows as much as you do. Yes. So um, that's the other thing is this is just our story. This is not telling you what to do. Um, We're not doctors. We're not lawyers. We're not medical, you know, those kinds of professionals. It could be the same exact results in a completely different way you handle it. Yeah. What you've, what we're going to tell you is like where we made some mistakes, Yep. what we found that we could have done better and you you need to um, impress upon them when someone's older that they're not kind of out to pasture. And if something just happens, that they're not worth still saving. Yeah. And I think that they are worth saving. Yeah, they are yeah. worth saving because I think sometimes they see somebody that's um, older and talking out of their head and out of it and everybody kind of writes it Simple. off. Yep. Um, if that was like a, you know, a, a eight year old kid, You'd it be would be a out. completely different conversation. Yeah. I, and I find that throughout my life being raised by my grandparents, there are so many instances where I have to defend them and I have to communicate for them because people just, don't take them seriously. It's and, ageism. And it's, it's ageism. ageism. It and, really is. And when that word first came up, I thought it was just a joke. And I, I'm like, really, this is ridiculous. And the more I see my parents get older, the more I realize it's true. Yeah. And it's just really unfair. <laughs> so I think that that was also a key for our success in being patient advocates is one, we had a lot of heads together. Mm-hmm. Um, two, we always had Um, someone with my grandma tried to when the doctors were around because they don't take her seriously, though. My grandma is a very well-researched woman. She will find out about anything. And even in her very strong emotional state, she is looking at his charts. She's looking at his numbers and she's really, really um, being thoughtful about what she feels like the best course of action is for her husband. Mm -hmm. And also the thing is, is that in our scenario, um, which is uh, probably common, there is a different doctor and two different nurses per day. 
and per shift. So that was like, that wasn't a 24 hours. That was like every seven to eight hours. And sometimes they hadn't even taken the time to read the chart when they came in to meet and greet us. Yeah. Or, or a lot of the times then what they're relying on is the notes that the previous staff took, Mm -hmm. which a lot of the time there weren't notes. Right. And there wasn't, um, you know, and so the only ones noticing certain changes, for instance, like there was a time where he, so basically what happened was he went into renal failure. They had to put him on dialysis. Mm -hmm. Um, then they, through the CT scan, found out that he had a bleed. So we were monitoring his bleed and he's a bleeder. And that's one thing that we've talked to, you know, my, my grandma has known that for a long time and that's something that's good to articulate to each one of the nurses. Um, but essentially, uh, there would be nurses that wouldn't notice the sh- changes in him because they weren't around him long and en- long enough to even detect that. So mm-hmm. I had a day where I came in where he had been off dialysis for maybe a day or so mm-hmm. and he was hallucinating. And I mean, other than it being, you know, wild to see your grandparent do that kind of um, funny kind of funny i mean there was like in his head there was 50 german shepherds that came and they all stood at attention <laughs> i was like man this guy's got a vivid imagination oh, yeah yeah <laughs> and and to be fair he has always talked in his sleep so yeah. it was one of those things that really actually wasn't that surprising yeah um but 50 german shepherds standing at attention that is that's great, great yeah right? that's, that's awesome. pretty awesome I would have loved to see he was that. also yeah. like doing this like, lsd trip kind of thing where yeah he was, like grabbing at stuff yeah and- grabbing at stuff and and also so i saw this kind of 180 shift now last week and until this point he was confused mm-hmm. and disoriented mm-hmm. but after he came off the dialysis he was completely hallucinating and when i mentioned this to the nurse she was like oh well you know icu delirium is this kind of thing where they get disoriented blah 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 we they normally we notice it at night when they're sleeping and when i told her well it's not at night it's been all day long and this is the first time i've ever seen him do it the entire time her face was like utter shock Mm -hmm. and that's just uh you know we ended up once he got back on dialysis he he was that completely went away and to be and to be clear previous to this procedure he had no issues right. with memory or disorientation or anything. No cognitive issues. No He's cognitive smart issues. Smart as a whip and yeah. he uses it. <laughs> and he uses it. And so um, part of it is we have learned as a family that no matter who you're meeting with, you whip out your phone and you record it so that you can actually focus on the conversation instead of trying to write down what they're saying. And then our family's very close. We don't have to play the telephone game and screw it up five times. Yeah. We can actually just send the file to everybody and they can hear exactly what the doctor said or what the ER person had said. And we had been doing that. Yeah. And I would say, I would caution you when you do go to record a medical professional, legally, you are allowed to, as far as I know, I'm not going to instruct you on that, but you should always have the etiquette of saying, Hey, is it okay if I record you? I'm doing this so that I don't have to repeat it to my family members a bunch of times. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because nobody really likes being recorded. Right. And I understand in that context, how you're like, just talking and it's kind of weird. So you should always ask for permission, even though you're allowed to do it. But it is a really useful tool, especially in places where Momo had been there for 10 hours by herself. And then a group of doctors come by. They don't even talk to her. Mm -hmm. They just talk kind of around him and decide what they're going to do with his life. Right. And that's what and we the exact scenario we ran into is I did not instruct my grandma to ask permission on the recording side, even though she's allowed to. And it really made a doctor very upset. And because of that, we didn't get so nice of treatment. Well, essentially, um, we knew he had a bleed and they wouldn't do another test on it to check. And they, and that was in the ICU. And until they released him down to a regular room, uh, we knew he was failing from that. He was doing better from the kidney dialysis, but failing on the blood work. And um, we were calling and begging people. And they said no. And we got him down to the different floor. And I asked the nurse and she's like, and it was 10 o'clock at night. And she's like, oh yeah, there's not a problem with that. We'll run that scan. And what do you know? He had a pseudo aneurysm 
which could have taken his life at any moment. Which uh, basically that's like a thinning of your art, mm-hmm. uh, artery. And so if that breaks, then you die. Basically, yep. there's nothing you can do. So, no, so we had a lot of um, then there was angst that we had before that. It was a simple test. But because we basically made somebody mad. You know, we don't get the power to put in an order. Yeah. And um, right, wrong or indifferent, the way we handled it, one, shouldn't have caused that doctor to do that. But two, if you understand that they can, it can have negative outcomes to your family member, maybe you handle it a little bit differently, right? And also, I wish we would have gone to the patient advocate. So so you should be an advocate for your own loved Mm ones. So recording things or at least writing them down, um, communicating with your family members, and also asking for tests that you believe they need because you know their medical history more than the doctor who is there for one single day knows. And And I will tell you, so my father goes to the VA and then all also was going to a different group for this because the VA doesn't do this. They don't have each other's records. They don't. So you think in this big world of electronic medical records that it's like, oh, they just press a button and see everything in all your life history. That's a no. So it, they don't have his history on diabetes. They don't have his history on COPD, that he was a bleeder. Um, just all these things that are really important, which is why when, you know, my grandma is speaking to them, communicating this actively and they're ignoring her because she's quote unquote old and doesn't know what she's talking about. Yeah. And, and let's be fair. He's uh, in two weeks, he's going to be 85. So if the average lifespan is what, 87 or something like that, they're like, well, you know. He's, it's his it, time. It's time. It's it. You know, yeah. in their mind. Yeah. I'm not saying they physically are saying that or they're doing that. But if you're in that all the time. Yeah. I had to keep on reminding the doctors, look, his dad lived to almost 100. His mom lived to almost 99 or was 99. So for him, 85, he's got a good 15 years. Exactly. After this. So let's not treat this like a, a national average. Yeah. Yeah. He's not average. But yeah, so going back to kind of this constant communication, so let's talk a little bit about how um, doctors communicate with each other. In our context, they communicated through this app called MyChart. Cool, because we get access to the test results mm-hmm. um, basically as quickly as we can, which is really awesome. So we yep. can be an advocate in that we can say, look, his levels were at this. Now they're at this, which is was a huge indicator and helpful in me convincing the doctor to test his kidneys again because he was only one point away from being critical. Yeah. And they were refusing after he had done the dialysis. After he'd done dialysis, they were refusing to check it again. And the last time they had checked it was four fifteen in the morning. And this was, you know, later in the day. Yeah. And um so from that standpoint, that's really great that you have that you so you may have access to that some because they're of that. dealing with they could be dealing with 20 patients. Right. Um, it's also Labor Day weekend. Right. So, so they're, doctors, short staff. they're short staff. Doctors are on call. Um, different things like that. Um, us being constantly in the know of it, it also allowed us to send messages to the medical team. Right. What we didn't know is that they had to kind of pre-approve it, almost like a person on the internet that's doing a, um, a room or whatever, where they're the moderator. The nurse pre-approves it before it goes to the whole team. So if the nurse, eh, it might not go all the way through. So I didn't realize that. Also, we were being told that all the messages that were being written and from us and from our nurses were being communicated all the way up the chain to his doctor who had um, prescribed the the procedure, essentially. Correct. Correct. Um, We later found out this was not true at all. Right. And that they had no idea what was going on. And that element of the communication. So my our advice kind of on that would be make sure that when you're communicating with your nurse, you say, I really want you to triple check that this has already been sent to this exact doctor Mm -hmm. and to make sure have them go in and check if it's actually been forwarded, have them go in and figure out if the information has been sent as stat. So can you explain why that's important? Yeah. So, uh, you know, part of it and, and we had great nurses and teams and doctors and we had just 
one or two that were not great, but one or two that could have cost him his life. His life. Um, and all it takes is kind of a little thing like that. Um, they were not uh, communicating. They are managing so much. It wasn't going up. We had to get um, the patient advocates involved. And I didn't know we could even do that until when we were checking into the ER at the very beginning, a guy came through and he was just asking date of birth, blah, 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 blah. Right. And he's like, do you have any questions for me? And we're like, nope. He said, if you don't understand anything or disagree with something or don't want a procedure or want something, all you have to do is come get me and find me or get to the patient advocate. And I'm like, okay, great. This is at the very beginning. It's so not necessary. It's kind of over my head. Basically, 24, 48 hours in just begging for a test that could have cost him his life, I remembered, oh my gosh, we need to call the patient advocate. And I asked for it from the nurse, didn't get, they said, yep, they're going to come up. 24 hours still wasn't up. Uh, my son, you want to tell that story or? Yeah. So essentially we're at this point where we've been moved rooms um, because the team and the ICU refused to do a CAT scan. They refused to do blood work until I negotiated with them. I said, I'm not. We are not transferring out of the ICU unless I get this blood work. Right. And they, they wouldn't do the scan. And they said, okay, but we're um, not, we're not holding his transfer up. And I said, fine. And I, cause I just kind of knew. And at that point, it was me, 26 years old, with my grandma, 83, in the room. And good thing that I had, you know, cell phone communication with my, um, you know, medical professional aunt who could tell me the exact, you know, chart that I needed to ask for. Mm -hmm. And um, I was able to negotiate that with the doctor. And so you do have the power to negotiate. So right. you have to remember that. Right. But um, so then we moved down to the other room, which was a blessing in disguise um, because we convinced that team. That team was like, oh, yeah, we can do the cat. Yeah, scan. no big deal. No like big it deal. was like before it was like I was asking to be sent to the moon. Yeah. And it, and it was going to actually harm him. And we asked them in five minutes and they're like, yeah, I talked to the doctor. No problem. We'll take him down right now. Yeah. Which and that's how saved we, his life. Exactly. And that's how we found out about the pseudoaneurysm, which is basically just a ticking time bomb. Yep. And especially when you're in that situation, if your blood pressure goes up, you die. Yeah, basically. So. The next day, we hear this, you know, we get a call from the doctor that they communicated to that this needs to happen right away. We need to be transferred to another hospital mm -hmm. to get a procedure done as soon as possible, like STAT. And um, we found out that the nurse accidentally didn't put it in a STAT. So um, that was one communication thing that's, you know, that's why you should double kind of, check Kind people. of a big deal. It's a very big deal. <laughs> Um, and so we're kind of running out of options. They just keep telling us that there's no rooms available, no rooms available at the hospital we're trying to go to. My brother, he leaves to go and run an errand after we've been at the hospital all day and he runs to leave an errand. Um, and he goes and he just feels kind of called by God and he just ends up at the hospital that we're going to, um, that we're supposed to be going to. And um, he goes in and he meets with the patient advocate mm -hmm. and she's like, you know, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you. Like, yes, we don't have a room, but we just don't have staff. Mm -hmm. So the issue was not that they didn't have a room. It was that they didn't have staff. So we could have, and it could have continued all the way until Tuesday. And, it was, a, and it was a couple issues. So they wanted him to go to the particular hospital, but that hospital had three different hospitals right there. So um, after then we spoke to the doctor again, let him know that we had engaged a patient advocate, which I'm sure their flags were going up all over. Um, my mom was like, oh my gosh, the doctors and the nurses are coming in here. And I'm like, yeah, that's because we're driving them nuts. <laughs> and um, he, you know, had talked to the the surgeon and they were like, the surgeon's on call. He's ready for you. What we're going to do is we're going to open up rooms in other hospitals. They're all connected by hallways, but like one specialized heart, one specialized general, and another one's cancer. And just by doing that, all of a sudden he got a room right. and he was able to then have the procedure. Yep. And it was um, a win for a story. Yeah, it really was. But one of the nurses was telling us that 
he had just experienced a similar thing last August with his mother in Pennsylvania, not in Ohio. And she was on a vent and they wanted to just take her off of it. And he said, you know, him and his brother just said, we can't. And they said, you know what this is going to do and blah, blah, blah. This is awful. And lo and behold, the next day she started coming back and she woke had, up. She woke yeah. up and had he followed the advice. Now, I'm not saying don't follow advice of the doctor, yeah. but you do have to do your due diligence and be your own advocate. Um, he said, yeah, my mom would have been gone. Yeah. So I think, you know, part of this is, is, you, you know, don't annoy people and don't, don't get in their business. Um, be respectful. Always be kind and respectful because not only is it um, a hard job, but they're, they're, your loved one's lives are literally in their hands. So yes. Yeah, if exactly. you can find any kind of motivation to be nice and respectful, that should be your motivation. So treat everybody with kindness, but ask for what you want. And if you, if you, people are not willing to give it to you, um, then speak with the patient advocate. And I, and you know, if we would have, that really helped. And I, you know, I didn't think about it at the very beginning. We should have gone to that first. We should have gone to them first. Exactly. But but we thought, you know, I was thinking, no, the doctors are going to be reasonable. Exactly. It's going to be reasonable. And, you know, it's called a practice for a reason. And if you talk to five doctors, you're going to get five do- different opinions. Um, and then here you got this annoying Italian family with 50 million people getting in your business. Yeah. But it's my dad. You know, that's the, that's a thing. And he knew he was going to go. He did, you know, a, you know, he said, I want to speak. And we recorded him and it was, he, he thought he was gone. And, um, so when it's your loved one, I think it's different. And I think, you know, some of the things you can do is prepare, um, have a conversation before a crisis. Um, and, and I speak at this from not only a daughter, an eldest daughter, but with my brothers and sisters, we were not prepared. As much as I talk about everything and talk to other people, um, I don't think it's clear to all five siblings what my parents' wishes are. And I, after this, I'm going to get that clear, get it in writing, get it signed by my parents, um, and talk about it. And then the other thing is, um, one of my really good friends, um, who had worked with me for years, um, passed away in January and he had had cancer on and off. Um, but about two weeks before he passed away and we worked together every day, he just didn't show up for work one day. Um, about two weeks prior, he said we were filing some stuff and he's like, Lisa, where's your, if I die book or if I die folder. And I'm like, you know, Michael, um, yeah, I don't have one of those. And he's like, I have one of those. He goes, you know how disrespectful that is to your family to not have that. It's, it's easier to have a, if I die folder, all they have to do is go and get it. And so when he didn't come to work and we were doing all the calls and he was greatly loved by us and it was not his nature, he loved work. He was a great architect. I said, I got to go check on him. And Addie said, no, I'll go check on him. And you saw him. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, yeah. So I, she saw him laying at the bottom of the steps called. Well, 911. I, yeah. It was more complicated than that, but, um, yeah, we just, you know, he was DOA and, but when the, when the police came in or the paramedics, they said, you know, they're on the phone, hand, Addie's phone to me and they said, um, what's his date of birth? And I'm like, I don't know. I'll have to get into payroll and see it. And I'm like, wait a second. He had, if I die folder, he had this folder and they like walked over. They actually found it and yeah. just found it. And that helped so much. So, you know, I'm going to create one of those. I'm definitely going to have a conversation before we have a crisis again, because you know what? The odds are not forever in our favor. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And also I think that um, it's important that, uh, that you have, like you communicate with your older kids and stuff like that as well, how to responsibly communicate with medical professionals, how Mm -hmm. to handle stuff in that, in those situations emotionally, you know, there's things like, while you're in the hospital, not talking about, okay, if we would have done this, if we would have done that, right. because you're 
in the scenario now, how do we move forward and how can we fix that? And, um, and not to have the play blame game with anybody. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it, it, is, it is all about how you move forward. You don't talk about the fumble. Um, you know, we still have great health care, but things happen. Yeah. And I think that um especially um when there's a shortage, there's a you know, there's a nursing shortage, there's a a a doctor shortage, you should consider these options that, okay, they might be saying that there's, you know, not a room available or things like that, but maybe asking, I wish I would have known those questions right. of just saying, are there really not rooms available or is there just no staff? That's okay because our family were excellent problem solvers, mm -hmm. but you can't solve the problem if you don't have the information. That's exactly right. Like, you know, when, when we found that out, I'm like, okay, cause we were going to check him out without me a medical release and take him to another hospital. I'm like, look, he's a tip ticking time bomb. We can check him out and put him in another hospital and then he can get the procedure done. But had we done that and there was no staff, Yep. That wouldn't have worked out so well. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, kind of understanding all that. Um, I think everybody was fairly calm. I, we had a group chat going on and that really helped the family keeping everyone informed in and yep. in the loop. Exactly. And then also clearly communicating. Um, as you know, Addie stated, Sometimes everything's an emergency and some people, nothing's an emergency. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of my sisters actually said to me that she really appreciated the fact that I said, you need to get to the hospital now. I didn't beat around the bush, but I, I, it wasn't a, if you can, it's your choice. It was, no, you need to come now, drop everything that you're doing and come now. Because in my heart, what I thought was, if she doesn't get to see him and have one last conversation or kiss, that's a horrible thing to do to somebody because you're trying to protect them. Yeah. You know? Um, so on the other hand, like I said, over the last three months, we've been to the ER a lot. A lot of times. And I never called anybody. And, yeah. And also mama, you know, sometimes she'll tell me things and I'll just say, well, what'd you eat today? And she'll be like, well, I had tuna and this and that. I'm like, well, that's why your stomach hurts, lady. You know? <laughs> yeah. so, so I think, I think, just in general, like communication is so important in these situations. Mm -hmm. Over communicate. It makes everybody feel secure. Um, make sure that you can communicate or just be aware of like how many people are in the room and stuff like that of mm -hmm. like um, giving people kind of their turns to do that as well. But in general, we kind of have, you know, three main points. It's just to have a plan in place and have that conversation before you have a crisis. Mm -hmm. Be an advocate. And then communicate well with your family and use the support that you can find. There are patient advocates. There's the internet. There is digital, you know, charting and texting. Um, it took me a little while, but I was able to get on. And now I have my parents on that. And then my sister, my one of my other sisters was able to do that. And I think that made all the difference in the world. Not hiding any information from anyone and letting them come in when they felt that it was necessary, but also being crystal clear when you felt it was a crisis. Yeah. So uh, what's one thing that you can do today to have a better tomorrow? I would just say, call your mom or dad and tell them that you love them because you can have a scenario and you might not be able to see them again. So I love you. I love you too. Thanks for watching and please like and subscribe. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a downer, but we're, we're sorry it's important. Time stops when we're alone. You got my love.